quickly because I have a lot to say. Anyone that knows me won't be surprised by that. Uh, welcome to Fort McMurray's second TEDx, last year being opportunity, this year being shift in thought. Now, shift in thought has the connotation that something needs to be changed, something needs to be better. What in the world needs to be made better? Do we need to end world wars, eradicate world hunger? There's all sorts of shifts in thought that our world is in need of. But I was raised in an Irish household, and we were taught, it's time to clean up your own backyard before you go knocking on your neighbor's door. Well, what in Canada needs to be changed? What needs to be made better? In 1990, the UN created the Human Development Index, ranking countries in the world as the best places to live for life opportunity. We ranked number one. This looked a lot bigger on eBay when I was buying it. <laughs> we ranked number one. But then something happened, and we slipped out of that number one spot. We dropped to number three, still a bronze medal. And then we dropped to four. Then we dropped to eight. And we've dropped out of the top 10 to number 11. We dropped to 13 when we include the gender inequality. Well, guess who's number one now? Not us. OK. So in the fire service, where I work, we're not exactly champions of the shift in thought motto. Okay? The running joke is that we're hundreds of years of tradition unimpeded by progress or change. But one of the things many of us are really good at is we're good at predicting outcomes based on how things work and how things look. Now, oil is a natural, valuable resource that we need. Almost 99% of the equipment you see here for my job is necessary. It's a, a petroleum product. Okay, so it's a valuable resource. And we have lots of it, so we don't have to worry, right? We don't need to worry because there's tons and tons of oil, second largest oil reserve in the world. But if we're looking ahead and we're predicting outcomes and problems, as we're good at in the fire service, we can see ahead that our opportunity is going to be in trouble. Okay, our opportunity is going to get really sick. And in the fire service, we can see that a building is going to get damaged by the fire and possibly collapse, or a patient's going to get more and more sick, their illness or injury is going to make them worse unless we interact on them. Okay? So we're really good at predicting these things and seeing where they're going to go. And I can tell you that it's not a pretty picture. And we have examples of it in history. Okay? That's Uranium City. That's a hotel. That's a school. That's condos like many of the ones here in Fort McMurray. They were almost a city of 10,000. And when the mines shut down, they lost over 95% of their population. Mass exodus. People left homes half-built there. They lost everything. That's Uranium City. We're way bigger than that, right? We don't have anything to worry about. We've got all the resource in the world. We're larger. That's Detroit. So what you see is you see the Detroit train station. Abandoned, surrounded by chain link fence, topped with barbed wire. We see schools larger than any of the ones here in Fort McMurray with no students. We see theaters, much like the one you're sitting in today, derelict, and communities, like the ones you live in. Friends, neighbors, abandoned. Do we have any positive examples where people have had a positive vision? They've looked ahead and said, we need to fix this because. Well, this is the Winnipeg floodway, spearheaded by a politician named Dufferin Roblin to prevent the yearly flood damages around the city of Winnipeg. The $74 million price tag in the late 50s opened him up to immense amounts of political ridicule. It was the second largest land moving project in its day behind the Panama Canal. It was supposed to have a 1 to a 2.3 cost return on saving flood damage costs. There have been many years where they have saved 1 to 40 return. It is estimated that since its creation, the Winnipeg floodway has saved the city of Winnipeg over a billion dollars in flood damage costs. That's a good return on your investment. That's some vision. How about this guy? Visionary? No, definitely not that guy. <laughs> OK, sorry about that one. Not the visionary. How about this guy? This handsome fella here, many of you may recognize as the bridge to nowhere. Some of you may even drive it daily to go to your jobs. 
It's called the Bridge to Nowhere because when it was spearheaded by Peter Lougheed, there was nothing north of the bridge. There were no companies that had started building yet, started their extraction processes. But Peter Lougheed had a vision. And Peter wasn't a strip it and ship it kind of fella. He had a vision for Canadians' future. And he came up with six principles of conservative, true conservative resource development for the betterment of all Canadians. Now, these six principles that he came up with are on the slide behind me. There are many Tory politicians out there that will commend Peter Lougheed and say, what a great politician he was, and what a great man he was. But none of them are following any of his six principles. Well, if we're not doing it right, then who is getting this right? Who is doing the right thing? What is the number one country in the world to live in right now? Norway, right? Viking heritage, Norway, with the hacking and slaying and the raping and pillaging, those guys? <laughs> if they can get it right, how come we as Canadians can't get it right? What are the Norwegians doing that is so right? Well, they're definitely behaving like owners. They're making all the companies pay for Norwegian resources. They're definitely collecting their fair share. There are some that would argue that Norway is collecting more than their fair share with some of the highest royalty rates in the world. But it is an unfair, cruel joke compared to what we are collecting as a fair share in Canada with some of the lowest royalty rates in the world. Save for a rainy day. Pete wasn't a strip it and ship it kind of fellow, as I said. He wanted to invest this. He created a heritage fund that was designed to take profit from the royalties and invest it in future Canadians. He started this in 76. By 1987, there was $15.2 billion in the heritage fund. And for some reason, the politicians of the day decided that was good, and they stopped contributing to the heritage fund. It stalled and has progressed to about $16.4 billion as of February 2013. Norway, on the other hand, started their Petroleum Sovereign Fund in 1990. They have over $712 billion in their fund. They use 4% of that a year for the services of the nation, childcare, healthcare, free post-secondary edu education. All sorts of programs that are making them one of the best countries in the world to live in. If we don't save for a rainy day, that $16.4 billion is already earmarked by today's government to spend on necessary infrastructure. So there will be nothing when the rain comes. Add value. Does anyone else beside me find it ridiculous that we take all our raw resources, ship them off to other nations, and then buy back refined or manufactured products at inflated prices. Sending away with that product all our resource job, our refinement job opportunities and our manufacturing job opportunities so that we have nothing. Go slow. Admittedly, Norway is one of the most expensive countries in the world to live. But it has been like that for many, many decades. During their recent boom in resource wealth, they have prevented inflation from making that cost of living any worse. Whereas any of you that have been in Fort McMurray for at least a decade, you've seen your house prices double. <coughs> you've seen your house prices maybe even triple since that time. The labor shortages, because of the struggle to get all the oil out yesterday, have driven wage prices through the roof. And that competing cost of living has put a huge strain on our local businesses, on our schools, on our hospitals, all sorts of things, on our emergency services. Practice statecraft. Peter Lougheed figured that these six principles should be put into law, that we should make laws to prevent to protect future Canadians, to protect our environment, to protect our natural resources from foreign investment. Norway's done all of that. 
Norway has invested in their future. They have created energy laws. They help third world resource rich nations create their own energy laws to protect their environments and their futures. They are the number one in technology and research and design and manufacturing. They're world leaders in this stuff. They've even created an ethics council so that the funds from this sovereign fund do not get invested in any controversial companies. They don't invest in any companies that deal with tobacco. They don't invest in companies that make guidance systems for nuclear weapons or missiles. They don't even invest in Walmart because they don't feel that they treat their employees fairly. Right? That hacking and slaying and the raping and pillaging, these guys. Because they don't think that they're nice people. So they've created and practiced this statecraft. Whereas none of these have been implemented. None of these are practiced. Well, we don't have to worry about this. We're not Norway. We are the second largest oil reserve in the world. Okay? The Alberta Energy Union Board estimated there was 173 billion barrels of economically viable oil in the tar sands. The International Energy Association ranked that even higher at 178 billion barrels of oil. Well, let's do some simple math here, shall we? 178 billion barrels of oil. That was a 2008 estimate. So forget about all the oil that's been already extracted. They figure that by 2015, all the oil companies together are going to be extracting at a rate of about 5 billion, sorry, 5 million barrels a day. Well, 5 million barrels a day into 178 billion, I'll do the math for you. 35,600 days, loads of time, right? Divided by 365 days a year, leaves us with 97.53 years. 98 years of oil in the tar sands. My great-grandmother in Ireland lived to be 101 and six days old, okay? Even if I see her years, I will not see the end of our oil, okay? So why do I care so much? My wife and I are expecting our first child. And the decisions we make today will decide everyone, every child's future in Canada. We have lots. We can be optimistic and we can say, well, new technology will come along. We'll have even more. We will be overflowing. But if we take, and we take, and we take, and we do not invest anything in our future generations, none of this wealth goes into their futures. What will we be leaving them when they have no resources to access? This will be one of the world's most expensive ghost towns, as you've seen. If we do not learn, if we don't invest this money into a secondary, not a supportive, but a secondary industry, this place will be a ghost town like the slides. And all the new shiny things that we build in Fort McMurray won't matter unless we have a future vision of something else when it's gone. There will be no children playing in our parks or our schools. The jobless will not be in our rec centers. They will not be able to afford tickets to any sporting event or any concert in any arena we build. They will only need the southbound lane of that twinned highway when it's gone. We can be hopeful and we can say that something will come up, we'll design newer technology. But we need to invest. If we do not learn from the lessons that have been shown on the screen, then we're going to get burned. Do we have to learn the hard way? Do we have to learn these lessons the hard way? Because if we do, it will be our future generations that get burned. Thank you.